What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel Critical Overload here. So we're going to talk about Halloween 9 in this video here today. One of the Halloween 9 drafts. Once again going over Halloween Retribution. So I was able to dig a little deeper into the screenplay and I wanted to recap it on this channel. However, I did not want to struggle to find some of the important bits and I was lucky to stumble across a article from the horror syndicate who actually goes over the halloween retribution screenplay mentioning all the important beats from it so i want to recap that film for you guys in this video going over the over the film that could have been again this is one of the many drafts that i'm sure existed for halloween 9 that would have been the sequel to halloween resurrection so touching on the beginning of this this began at Smith's Grove on Halloween night in 1964. A colleague of Dr. Loomis named Dr. Hill visits a young Michael Myers, believing that no one is beyond retribution. A nurse named Spence agrees with this, knowing very well that the young boy locked in the cell is pure evil and deserving of being locked away. Dr. Hill is left in a room with Michael, whose eyes are described as being black, as he tries to reach the child, attempting to get him to be responsive by encouraging him to draw with colored pencils. Instead, Michael looks at Dr. Hill with his black eyes and stabs his own hand with a colored pencil. This freaks Dr. Hill, and as he reacts to this, Michael grabs a hold of him with his other hand. There is a struggle as Dr. Hill screams for help, and Nurse Spence and other orderlies arrive to free Dr. Hill from Michael's grip. Unknowing to any of them, somehow Michael steals Dr. Hill's horn-rimmed glasses. We then go 15 years later to the night that Michael escapes from Smith's Grove in 78. An older nurse Spence visits Michael informing him that she is retiring and gloating about how Dr. Loomis is going to be bringing him bringing him before the state board to keep him locked up for the rest of his life. But then as she turns to leave, Michael makes a noise which stops nurse Spence in her tracks she goes back towards him attempting to get him to speak again but then it's revealed that michael had made a blade out of the glasses he stole 15 years earlier and sliced through his straight jacket freeing himself he kills nurse spence and then wanders the hospital even at one point going to the files on him we then see him driving away in loomis's station wagon so this movie if we had gotten it would have shown us the night he escaped in a little bit more specific detail so then we jump to present day 2004, set some time after the events of Resurrection, where we meet the new lead protagonist named Lee or Leia, who is on a small getaway with the family of her friend Tanya, whom she's been estranged from for a while now. It's established here that the road to the cabin leads past the now abandoned Smith's Grove Hospital, which comes into play later on in this screenplay. Meanwhile, at a local university, Freddie Harris is promoting his new book, which boasts about how he defeated fear and killed michael myers as freddie signs autographs he is approached by a man who is revealed to be john tate john questions freddie about michael's demise not believing that this is true freddie however insists that michael is indeed deceased later as freddie leaves he takes notice that his tires have been slashed just then a campus security suv pulls up freddie approaches asking for help but doesn't get a response it's revealed that a campus security offer is dead in the passenger seat and michael is behind the wheel michael backs the suv up and while freddie gets the jack out of his trunk michael steps out of the vehicle michael knocks freddie down with a nightstick but freddie recovers and pulls a gun out he insists that it can't be michael and demands that the person in the mask in front of him remove the mask before Freddie can fire the gun. Michael knocks Freddie down again, causing him to drop the gun. Freddie and Michael get into a short scuffle as Michael tightens his grip on Freddie's throat. Freddie fights back briefly, telling Michael that he is not afraid of him. Michael then forces his knife into Freddie's chest, killing him. Later on, John, of course, discovers Freddie's body and notices the campus security vehicle approaching and then coming to a stop. John goes to the SUV, but notices that something isn't right. He knows that Michael is behind the wheel, and as he reaches for the door handle, Michael steps on the gas and drives away. Now, we jump back to the current characters or the new batch of characters we were introduced to driving to the cabin. Uh, we're reintroduced to Leia and Tanya as well as many of their friends and classmates. While most of the characters are, are appearing throughout this story, none of them are particularly interesting or distinct. I would have to agree with the sentiment here from this article. None of them really stand out. Uh, aside from faceless and pointless characters that only exist within this story for the sake of body count, we are introduced to Daryl, an edgelord loner, pegged to be a potential mass shooter by his peers who continue to give him shit. We're also introduced to Jenny, who is the daughter of, Sher of the sheriff. And then later on, we're introduced to Leia's younger brother, Noah, who is a mute and communicates with sign language. Leia, Daryl, Jenny, and Noah are the only four teenagers to give a shit about while the rest are obnoxious and useless. 
I, I really only cared about Leia, to be honest. While or with the holiday of Halloween banned in the town of Haddonfield and a curfew in effect, the teens concoct a plan to sneak away and have a Halloween party at Tanya's family cabin. Leia agrees to go as long as she can bring along her little brother. Meanwhile, while that's going on, we see John Tate visiting Lori's grave. The following day, as the teens gather in a van for their trip, John is shown standing outside of the outside of the plot of land that the Myers house once stood on prior to the fire at the end of Resurrection. Here, John is approached by Sheriff Shaw, who doesn't recognize him at first. Shaw threatens to haul John's ass to jail if he doesn't move along, but then he recognizes him after seeing some ID and offers his condolences, as he apparently went to school with Lori back in the day. John mentions that he believes Michael is still alive, but Sheriff Shaw is convinced that Michael is dead and politely asks John to go home. As the teenagers make their way to the cabin, the van suddenly breaks down as they near the abandoned hospital. Tanya and her boyfriend run off into the woods to have sex, despite the frigid temperature. However, in the middle of their trip to Pound Town, they discover a woman's body buried in the leaves, which naturally kills the mood. Meanwhile, Leia wanders around the woods looking for Noah and runs into Daryl, who is hanging around with a crossbow. This begs the question of how he got here without an automobile. Considering the distance between Haddonfield and Smith's Grove, as an established as established in the original John Carpenter film, and their small talk is interrupted by Tanya's naked boyfriend who runs towards them urgently. All of the teens gather at the spot where the body was discovered, but the body is now missing and nobody believes Tanya or her boyfriend about the body they saw. And it's never mentioned again. Daryl manages to fix the van, but at this point, the frigid weather breaks into a pre-winter blizzard of snow and sleet and the van can't make it in these conditions. The group of teenagers decide to take shelter in the abandoned hospital instead. So a lot of this story, yes, it takes place in Smith's Grove. One of the teens attempts to reach out to the local authorities to help with their situation, but because of the storm, they're told to hold tight or to sit tight. Back in Haddonfield, John is shown researching his uncle Michael Myers when he's approached by Leigh Brackett, who's also, who also isn't satisfied with the theory that Michael had died and shows John some newspaper clippings regarding the situation at the morgue that occurred the night Michael's body was brought in. So this event was brought to the news, which again still begs the question, why is Freddy and everyone else so deluded into thinking he's dead? Brackett believes that Michael is alive and still killing and is responsible for multiple unsolved murders that have been happening in the state. They both know that Michael will return home to Haddonfield, but with the Myers house burned to the ground, the question remains where, which is where Smith's Grove comes into play. He lost one home, but he knows Smith's Grove was his second home. So that's why he's going to Smith's Grove. As John continues his investigation, the teens wander around the abandoned Smith's Grove hospital and, and these scenes, according to this person, and I do agree when I was reading the script, they are not very interesting. The teens are eventually forced stalked and killed one by one by Michael. And at first, Daryl is blamed for what's happening, although both Leia and her brother don't buy it. Uh, John visits the home of Dr. Hill and discovers his dead body in the living room and then leaves the scene. He then ventures to the home of another colleague of Loomis and Hill, where he talks to the man's widowed wife. Here she mentions how the treatment of the patients at Smith's Grove haunted her husband up until the day he was murdered. John then figures out that, Mi that Michael must be at Smith's Grove, his secondary home. John tries to contact the police department who has jurisdiction of the area that the institution resides on, but the police believe that this is nothing more than a prank, uh, typical horror stuff. <laughs> they inform John that these people are stuck up in this area and that due to the storm, they were instructed to stay put and they advise John to do the same thing as the road isn't safe to travel. John then, John then contacts Brackett asking for his help, hoping that Brackett's position as a former sheriff would help convince the police to do something, but Brackett doesn't respond at first and their phone call ends. Okay. So after the phone conversation between him and John, we get to see how Brackett was affected by that night in 78, not only because he lost his daughter, but also because of his guilt. The conversations between Brackett and Loomis from 1978 play over as a voiceover and highlight his sense of guilt for not taking Loomis seriously back in 78 and that his lack of action on that night led to his greatest tragedy. He goes to his basement to get his gun and old badge and then goes to see Sheriff Shaw. This kind of reminds me of Dewey in Screen 5. 
Shaw offers sympathy towards Brackett, just believing that this night is difficult one for him due to his loss 25 years earlier, and suggests that Brackett just go home. Brackett, however, plays into this as he sneakily steals the keys to Shaw's cruiser. Brackett hops into the cruiser and takes off towards Smith's Grove. Back at the former hospital, the surviving teens trying to keep themselves hidden from Michael. They come across old video footage of Loomis's sessions with young Michael, as well as a bunch of files on Michael that, that they rummage through. After once again being attacked by Michael, resulting in Daryl's death, the remaining teens flee and hide elsewhere, and then in a move taken directly out of a Friday the 13th movie, Leia realizes that she looks like Judith and trims her hair. Now, going off of the description of what was done in the screenplay, no, you don't. <laughs> so I really didn't understand this. So she cuts her hair and then speaks to Michael as if she's Judith to lead him away from her brother. Similar to how, of course, you would put on the sweater to trick Jason into thinking you're his mother, I guess. So she's doing this, pretending to be Judith to lead him away from her brother and Jenny, and thus begins a long chase through the tunnels below Smith's Grove. So you're going to get a chase scene between our lead final girl and Michael Myers. Uh, Brackett and John meet up outside of Smith's Grove. They venture inside. They find Noah and Jenny, and Brackett stays with them as John searches for Leia in the tunnels below. Brackett does eventually come face to face with Michael and attempts to shoot him for revenge over Annie, but the gun jams and Michael walks away from him, continuing his pursuit of John and Leia. Eventually, John is wounded by Michael, but him and Leia escape through a tunnel that leads them outside of the building. They tumble down a snow covered embankment and John is moment momentarily knocked unconscious. Brackett, Noah, and Jenny venture outside, and just as Michael attempts to lunge at Leia, Noah musters up a scream to warn her. She avoids the killing blow, but Michael does get a grip on her arm, preventing her from getting away. Just as he brings up the knife with his free hand, he is distracted by a shout from his nephew, John. John then throws his axe through the air and it connects with Michael's chest, causing Michael to tumble further down the embankment. Michael does get back up, removing the axe from his chest, but then there is a crack beneath him and ice gives, gives way, causing Michael to fall into the water below and he becomes trapped beneath the ice. As the survivors approach the ice for a glimpse and confirmation that Michael is finally dead, Michael punches through the ice and grabs John, pulling him into the water below. Eventually, John reemerges with Michael's mask, and Leia suggests that John get rid of the mask because it's evil, but John is compelled to hold on to it and looks at it with black eyes. So at the end of this, they're obviously teasing that there's some type of mystical power going on with that mask, I would guess, and, a, and it's implied that John is going to now become the next Michael Myers. He's going to pick up where his uncle left off, similar to how Halloween 4 ended, similar to how, what was it, Friday the 13th Part 5 ended with Tommy. You know, the ending is, is something I would completely redo. Everything in between at Smith's Grove, that's where I see this story have a, having a lot of potential. I love how they brought back Sheriff Brackett. I love the interaction between him and John Tate. Some of the new characters, again, for the most part, when I read the screenplay, I thought they were very unforgettable. Or forgettable, I meant to say. So, aside from that, you guys can let me know what you think about this brief re Well probably one of my longest videos <laughs> let me know what you think about this recap of the halloween retribution screenplay i'll leave a link to it actually down in the comment section below if you want to read a copy of it if you haven't already of course make sure you subscribe turn on post notification and there's a video in the description i'll have links on my social media accounts i am on facebook twitter and instagram you can message me there of course let me know if there's any movies news or reviews you'd like me to cover in the future and with all that in mind guys i will see you in the next video